I'm, I'm Alex Cern. I'm from Queen Mary University of London. Um, I wear a number of hats there, but in this context, I'm a researcher um, uh, working with particle physicists. Um, and uh, many moons ago, I used to be a network in the networking team at Leicester University. So I, f I feel like I can talk to you as networking people, uh, but uh, I don't feel a complete fraud being at this meeting. Um, so. Net zero is clearly big in the news at the moment. Um, I don't think the news from last week is going to affect what I've got to say. Um, so I've got a couple of links here. One is the final report to the RSCast report on the left, and on the right is the uh, final report of the net zero scoping project. That's all going to make sense imminently. So. In uh, May of 2019, Parliament described, uh, declared uh, an environment and climate emergency. Um, and then later in 2019, the UK became the first major economy to adopt a legally binding target of net zero by 2050. On the back of that, UK Research and Innovation, which is the government body that uh, funnels taxpayers' money to UK researchers, through the research councils, uh, they declared that they would be net zero by 2040, um, wanting to sort of lead, being, being researchers and innovators, they wanted to lead that and declared 2040 as their target date. And that included their digital research infrastructure, so all their compute clusters, um, which are quite a diverse, heterogeneous set of things all over the country. So how are they going to go about doing that? Well, we're going to have a scoping project, aren't we? So the UKRI Net Zero Digital Research uh, DRI scoping project was formed, and the core team commissioned uh, nine of the things that you can see there on the right of the screen, nine, nine projects and evidence uh, gathering uh, exercises. And they realized that they were a small, small team, uh, uh, and so they should reach out to the UK academic community. And so these sandpit projects on the left-hand side of the, of the screen there are the, uh, the, the ideas that academics across the country had to help gather evidence. And RSCast is one of those projects. So that's the context. In RSCast, we want to measure the carbon footprint. Um, and so we were a collaboration from, you can see the read the names. I'm not going to read them out. Um, the, uh, on the left there, you've got the, uh, the people that were paid for by the project, the, the management team, and then underneath the people that actually did the work. And then on the right, um, we couldn't do this by ourselves. We were only um, a small number of institutions. We wanted to do this uh, across the UK, so we recruited our friends at other institutions to help us. And um, the, these volunteers uh, put in a lot of work, so my great thanks to them. The name uh, needs a bit of, like all things, I was been learning a lot of uh, networking acronyms uh, yesterday, so there's some acronym salad here as well. IRIS is the E Infrastructure for Research and Innovation for STFC. Now, STFC is one of the research councils for Science and Technology Facilities Council, uh, one of the parts of UKRI, more word salad. And it's a, a loosely um, cooperative community bringing together the different computing interests uh, around big science, and it's a bottom-up run by the scientists rather than the research council. Uh, and uh, my boss, John Hayes, is, uh, is the science director of IRIS and also the um, PI for the, the IRIS cast project, so you can see where the name came from there. And the cast bit is a carbon audit snapshot. So the idea was we were going to get six data centers around the country and uh, we wanted to find out what their footprints were in a day um, over the course of 24 hours. And this is because to make good decisions, we need robust information. And robust information means we need to get some data, make some measurements. So we wanted to estimate the carbon costs across this broad heterogeneous landscape. We wanted to identify the driving factors and we wanted to uh, w work out what the, the problems and hurdles and barriers are and um, get a team together um, so we could work coherently across different facilities with different people, different skill sets, different remits, different tools, different capabilities. And the key thing also was to learn by doing. 
we could sit on our hands and, and wait for these deadlines for net zero to come along and know, not know how we're going to achieve them. Or we can just start doing something now, get it wrong, uh, learn from our mistakes and, and do better jobs next time round. And so we started approaching this with a learning by doing approach. So to actually make sense of this and actually come out with a carbon footprint, we had to come up with some, some silly equations. So um, the, our, the, the, the small one at the top there, essentially we're saying that uh, the total amount of carbon in a period P is the sum of the active carbon. Um, so that's the scope one and two emissions, if you're talking in uh, LCA language. And um, then added to that, we've got to think about the embedded carbon. So that's the carbon that was used to build the computers or the switches um, and the networks uh, and, the, and the buildings. Um, so that's the, the embedded carbon. We've got to take that into account. So that level, that all makes sense, but we need to split this down a bit. So the, the actual uh, active carbon um, is going to be basically the co carbon cost of running the kit. So that's basically going to be the electricity bill, if you like. So we need to add up all the electricity used by all our compute nodes. We need to add up all the electricity used by our networking equipment in our clusters. Or consider the, uh, the cooling systems, the air conditioning, and consider perhaps the power distribution, um, inefficiencies in the power distribution within the room, uh, and also then the energy of the facilities. So what are the sysadmins computers using? What about the lights? The, all those sorts of things. So if we wanted to get a ac very accurate thing, we've got to think about all these things. We sum that up, and then we can say, what was the carbon mix on the national grid that day? Ah, and that's that factor that we multiply it by to get our carbon footprint. So the active carbon, fairly straightforward in some ways, whereas the, uh, the embedded carbon, that's where perhaps some of the, uh, the devil in, is in the detail here. We need to think about the, uh, the how much carbon was used to create, say, a switch, and then what's the lifetime of that switch going to be? Um, and we need to then, uh, we can apportion that over the lifetime of, of the device. And then for a period P, we can add that all up uh, and add it up by all the different switches, all the different compute nodes, all the different facility items. And, and again, we get our embedded carbon cost. So that's our model. Um, So from that model, clearly we needed to um, get an uh, inventory of all the different kit that uh, were, was in these different uh, facilities. We um, partnered with uh, six, six different facilities, uh, as you can see listed there. And um, I've got to point out these inventories aren't all their kit. Uh, we had a limited limited resources and time frame, so we had to draw a line around the kit that we would put into the audit. Um, so uh, the different institutions had different different kit there. Um, the, at some level, the details aren't particularly important, but um, we've got a mixture of uh, generically we've got servers, uh, compute servers, we've got switches. Some of these servers have got GPU cards inside. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, that, that's basically what we've got there. Um, and so to get to this point, we had to have meetings, build our community, and to get to know each other and decide how we were going to gather this together. So, of course, when you ask someone to go out and give you a list of all their kit, it all seems, that seems like a nice clear instruction and everyone gives it back to you in many different various ways. So specifying these things clearly is clearly a lesson learned. So then we got to the, uh, the fun bit, making lists of equipment, that's never much fun. We got to the much more fun bit of taking the 24 hour snapshot. So we, each, uh, each facility, Developed uh, either developed from scratch some scripts in our case, um, or delved into their existing uh, monitoring systems and pulled out different data. And we wanted to measure, uh, measure things at um, 
a number of different levels. We ideally wanted to meet, measure things right up at the facility level, but it turned out that we didn't really, no one really had a good idea of how their power usage, uh, their PUE and the cost of their cooling. No one really had um, any electricity meters on the, the power feeds into the data centers. So that was, that was poorly understood and perhaps quite easy to fix. But at this stage, it was poorly understood. We also wanted to then drill down to sort of the rack level or the enclosure level. Um, that was fairly straightforward. Lots of people had uh, existing PDUs uh, that they were monitoring for power into the racks, um, mostly monitoring those with their SNMP. Uh, and then at the node level, um, on compute servers, we have BMCs, base board management controllers that, that monitor the system internally. And we can read out from those over the, using the IPMI protocol, we can read out the, the power usage there. So, so that was quite an interest. That was, these were the common things that everyone could do. We wanted to also drill down to actually what were the actual jobs, because this is all about compute nodes rather than switches, I'm afraid, and drilling down into what the jobs were doing um, and how much um, energy each job was using. That was very difficult to, to um, get a handle on. However, Slurm, one of the job managers that one of the sites used, was configured up to use the uh, use to report that, gather and report that data. And I think that uses the, the RAPL um, element of the, uh, the uh, AMD and Intel, Intel chips, um, which is another acronym which I would have to look up, I'm afraid. But it's, uh, essentially, it's, uh, it's, it's their uh, um, internal querying from the, the chipset of how much energy is being used. So this is my big bugbear, is, um, and it's actually worth asking a question here. You might not get the answers I'm expecting. We'll find out. So who here in your, your, um, your, your networks uh, monitors power? And if you do, do you monitor so kilowatts or amps? Any hands for that? Or Excellent. Both. Excellent. And who here measures kilowatt hours or joules, the actual energy? OK. The, OK, so people are doing it just getting everything. Great. Um, so when, when we came across this, um, the six different uh, institutes, lots of us already had um, power or current, and so we just gathered that, whereas actually we needed energy. We can integrate it up. We can do the maths and integrate it up, but if we have missing data points, then that's not very robust. So, so my little uh, learning point was actually see if you can measure energy directly, and there's some examples of how you can do that. Um, although there's some really rather weird units of hectawatt hours, um, which um, yeah, we can all multiply and divide by 10, so that's not, not too difficult to deal with. So um, I ought to start rattling through this. Uh, PDUs and IPMI. So not everyone had PDUs, so this table here shows us the total amount of energy that each, um, each institute was measuring. Um, we thought that PDUs were the better measurement, the measurement into the rack, um, and where that wasn't available, we've just slid the IPMI measurement across. But where we've got both measurements, it's quite interesting to see that most sites, the IPMI uh, measurement was about 20% less than the, the PDU measurement. So there's a 20% loss or 20% difference in the measurement there. Um, Everywhere except for Queen Mary, where we only had 1.5% difference. So that was a bit of a head scratcher. So we decided to rerun our measurements. We got our, our brand spanking new PDUs out that could measure each individual port. And that's what we give on the bottom graph. And uh, there you see we find a 20% difference. So um, that's still unexplained. And there's, I think the takeaway is that you need to calibrate if you're going to um, take multiple measurements, you need to calibrate and understand exactly where you're measuring. Maybe we're measuring with IPMI after the power supply, and maybe the power supply's got a 20% loss, maybe, and the PDU is measuring before that. So it's understanding exactly what you're measuring and maybe calibrating between the two. That, that might be important, or is important. So we put all this into our carbon model. Now, that sounds great, except 
um, one of the inputs to our carbon model was the l embedded carbon for all these bits of equipment. And manufacturers really don't like to give you that information. And if they do, they'll give it to you in a slightly obfuscated way. And so we couldn't really tease that out at the moment. But what we could do is get a range of measurements. So we had a range of measurements, for a range of estimates for that. We could also do that for our PUE, because we didn't really know what was happening there. And for um, our server lifespans, we could model that. So we've put all that together, and uh, you get this big grid of uh, numbers here. But the key things really are the, 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 the bold numbers that um, in the high, high, high quadrant, sort of bottom right-ish, there's a, a bold 11,719. So that's our, our upper, upper estimate. And then in the low, low seven-year um, box, there's a, 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 a 1,449 uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now, we, the numbers don't really matter. What matters is that that's an order of magnitude, that's a factor of 10 difference. So that tells us that if we actually make a bit of effort, we can make a big change here. So that was the learning point there. So that then brings us on to the conclusions for RSCast. So the RSCast project brought this together into a long report, which the link's on the front page. You can read that at your leisure. But the, sh the short version is we want to have high-level feedback that can go up to um, strategy makers, grant bodies, uh, and uh, for that, we think we need to get together the, f the five things on the left. We want to um, look at uh, including some sort of scoring uh, into our procurement uh, to take account of embedded carbon costs and energy usage. So talk to our procurement people about that. We need to um, make sure that new stuff we buy can measure en energy. Um, I guess in, the, in, in your world, you've had a long thing for um, IPv6 ready uh, was a thing at one stage. Well, we need to be power, me power measurement ready, um, which men men many things are, but it does need thinking about. Um, and we also then found a big gap in measuring our cooling infrastructure. That's something we need to put right. And we need to keep these inventories of equipment perhaps up to date. And as we buy new kit and put it in there, let's add the embedded carbon costs there and, and the idle power draw. Then we will be in the place to be able to put together monthly reports or other periodic reports uh, based on those. And that can flow up the decision management chain to the to the big decision makers. And then on the other side, we want the low level feedback because we've got scientists and communities of scientists running their jobs, um, actually doing the science on these computers. And we want to give them some indication of whether they're doing a good or a bad job um, carbon wise when they're doing these, get it, generating their results. Um, so we want to collect more of the uh, job level energy management using tools like Slurm, using the, the RAPL things I was mentioning. Uh, and then we need to identify the user communities and the right people to get that information to, because some scientists just use a tool they're provided. So we need to get to the people that are writing that code to get them to make it more efficient. So that was the RSCast um, conclusions. The other sub-projects also reported back in, and I was then asked to help write the, the final report for the net zero scoping project, mostly summarizing the other sandpit projects. Um, so what came out of this um, was, amongst all of those projects that I showed you earlier, I did, didn't actually point out, one of those projects that was commissioned was an art commission because this was for all of the different research councils, including the Arts Research Council. And so uh, we're, this is where these pictures of artwork come from, and there's more of that in a moment. So the two main outputs, uh, well, the three outputs was the artwork. There was then a roadmap for delivery and a toolkit for delivery. Um, the 160-page re report has uh, 24 elements to the roadmap and 180 recommendations. So you'll be relieved here. I'm not going through each of those one by one. Um, I've just got two slides to summarize that. So the, uh, 
the uh, the roadmap is in in three streams. Uh, we've got which are conveniently covered up. We've got governance uh, is is that uh, left hand stream in blue. Um, so that's drafting policies uh, and uh, then implementing policies and then make, cracking the whip to make sure that they're actually followed is basically the three stages there. In the middle, we've got a delivery partnership. Um, this is essentially a bid by the, the scoping project team to actually be rehired or someone will need to be rehired to actually run this and advise, advise the higher ups and, and project manage it. So, so that's this middle stream uh, of coordinating things and developing some of the tooling, uh, some of the protocols we'll need to do this measurement and report back on this. And yet again, they realize they can't do that all by themselves. So they were going to spin out some of that with competitive funding to which is the, the, the right hand stream there. Um, so people like me perhaps can help do a little bit of that work. And then the uh, the toolkit um, breaks down into six six things. Uh, we've got mission focus, which uh, the short version of that is, if we become super efficient, everyone's going to want to do more stuff, and then we won't have made things better. So I know uh, as as things develop, we always want to do more stuff, but we've got to be quite careful about that, how we manage that, so that we don't actually um, totally um, negate all our, our benefits by, by doing much more stuff, um, which will uh, use more carbon. So that's, that's the mission focus element. We need to empower people to make the changes. We then need to do more of this action-based research, which is another way of saying learning by doing. Um, and we need to start now and crack on with this. And whilst we still have time to make mistakes, uh, we need to work with our peers and suppliers um, we've already talked about dealing with procurement and contracting. And then another key thing is Iriscast and the other projects have all learnt things. We need to have a central repository to um, bring that together and then uh, push it out to the community. So we need this uh, to build a, a, a knowledge sharing platform. And then green <coughs> software engineering. So this... I think is a bit of a rebranding of what we're already doing. We already have research software engineers, and their jobs are to look at the code bases that the scientists are using and to uh, tweak them so that they're more efficient. But they're normally targeting efficiency in time. So perhaps if we can give them some new tools or um, uh, point them in the right direction so they're actually optimizing for carbon footprint, then suddenly they become green software engineers. Um, so that's another stream of work there. And another piece of art. Which brings us to the other output, which was the, the artwork. This was the artwork of the artist Paul Milhouse Smith. Um, these are digitally printed th um, uh, vases, uh, ceramic vases, th uh, 3D digital prints. Um, so he also ran some workshops talking to the people that run these digital research infrastructures. So I, I wonder whether the sketch under, under the gentleman there is, is sort of ones and zeros, perhaps, and maybe, maybe a spiral down towards net zero and maybe some carbon graphite. I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't part of those workshops. But um, the, that was the art. And, and that, well, I've got another minute, so I, I can... <laughs> I can, I can bore you with one other thing. So at Queen Mary, we're, we're trying to get into this whole sustainability thing. And on campus, we've got a big data center. And we've also got on campus a district heating system that links up several of our buildings already with a gas boiler. So we're renovating our, one of our big machine rooms and putting in heat pumps there so that we can actually take the waste heat from our data center Pump it up to seven, heat pump it up to 75 degrees C, where it can go into the um, district heating. And when we extend that to the student residences, it means we'll have to keep the computers on so the students can share in the morning. So uh, that's another piece of work we're doing there. So thank you ever so much for inviting me, and thank you for listening.
Um, hi, a very good hi. talk. Thank I've you. I've seen it before, of course. But I think my, my question would be, well, first, there's an observation that that set of six um, sort of strategic themes, I think, even though you're from a sort of slightly different background to the men, many of the people in the room, I think that applies very, very well to everyone in the room here. And particularly what we might want to think about as UK North is number five, about how we build and, and share knowledge. But my question is, um, having done this and dipped your toe in the water rather than you know, prevaricating, which I think is good, are you now optimistic that we're going to get there? Are you more optimistic or less optimistic than when you started? Um, so uh, I've given this talk in various forms about four times now. And uh, one of the comments uh, at one of the, that after the talk was from someone was, um, I don't know why we're shilly-shallying around with this, just buy, gr buy green electricity and we're done. Now, yeah, we could do that, but there's not enough green electricity to go round. Um, so, so that's part of that problem. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a very difficult problem. Um, if we want to be absolute zero, we turn the computers off. Well, that's no good to anyone. We've, how do we value the, uh, the carbon footprint reduced through the research? There's a, it's very, very tricky. Am I more or less optimistic? Um, I, you've got to be optimistic, haven't you? Otherwise, you'd never get out of bed in the morning. Um, but I think there's, I think there's also there's some there's some politics and game playing to be had with this. But I, I yeah, get on and start, see where we get to. So I have a couple of questions, but I'm able to take my turn with these guys here anyway. The first question is from Rob Kennedy from Infineera, who says, when considering embedded carbon, how far back through the manufacturing chain do you go? For example, does it consider mining costs for raw materials? Um, there's an additional comment, actually, from Chris Russell from, um, who did he say it was from? Uh, Pulsant. Pulsant who actually commented at the same time in relation to that question. Um, it also means that the availability of data from suppliers is an essential requirement as well. So, so there is actually, there's an ISO standard, uh, which I've forgotten the number of, that's called life cycle analysis. So there is actually a standard to refer to with regards to how far back you go. And yes, it does include the mining costs. Um, and Undertaking those analyses is a quite, uh, a, a quite difficult, um, a perhaps lighter weight route to getting something similar is there's a, a project in the States, again, I'm afraid I've forgotten the name off the top of my head, where um, some researchers have um, taken different components and, and put together a value for that component. So then you can take the components from their, their database and build your system from that to so, get an approximation. So, so essentially taking prior art. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to ask yours? Or not? So hopefully that answers that question. Hi, uh, my name's James. Thanks very much for the talk. Really Thank interesting. I, on a personal level uh, and professional level, this is a very hot topic, I think. So I, my day job, I work for a company called Interlink. We are a sustainable connectivity provider. We're a carbon neutral connectivity provider. I totally understand how difficult this is. Like It has been a real headache for us to get to carbon neutral. Um, so we are technically European based, as in where our company is registered, uh, and the EU are bringing in the um, CSRD. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not. It's more, act more word salad, so it's the Corporate Sustainable Reporting uh, Directive. And this affects private companies above a certain size. Starting next year, they will have to provide their carbon impact reports, and then 2025, they um, increase the scope. So it start with very large companies and then it'll be sort of small to medium will come into scope and stuff. Uh, and so my question is, are you aware, because it's, we're based in European, so we're very clued up on European law, but not so much the UK. Are you aware of something happening in the UK um, which affects not private industry? So universities and re any legislation that comes in that kind of puts the thumb screws on public sector or research or education? I'm, I'm not aware of that myself, no. Um, I think, so from the researcher's perspective, this, this, uh, this scoping project shows us what's happening in the digital research area. 
um, UKRI are no doubt getting other reports of how they're going to do net zero overall. So I think for the researchers, the, re the, the before too long, when they're offered a grant, in that grant contract, it's going to have a whole load of reporting, and that's how it'll happen on the research side. I can't, um, I'm not, don't have the answers about the university sector on the other parts of the, yeah. what universities do, I'm afraid. No, no, but, still interesting, yeah. so thanks. thanks. Thank you. Okay, this should be, I think, a relatively quick question, and it is from Chris Russell from Pulsant, and he asks, did you look at hypervisor power modes in a VM world, i.e. full performance versus power saving mode, on whether there was room to, de to deploy the latter and still provide the required performance? So IRISCast didn't, um, but one of the other Sandpit projects did. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember which one, which is really annoying, but there's, 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 there's six of them there, um, and uh, yeah, um, so, so work was done on that sort of thing, work was done on um, whether ARM cores are better than Intel cores, work was done on is it better to farm jobs, uh, optimise jobs on um, FPGAs or, um, or um, GPUs or CPUs. So yes, uh, different groups did different analyses there, so, so uh, uh, I'm afraid I can't signpost you directly to the answer, but there, there, some work was done on that. Thank you. And the last one? Yeah, sorry, uh, it's actually a two, two questions. Um, first one is, um, obviously you've talked a lot around sort of servers and server platforms and things. Um, obviously us in the room here all network, but uh, within the UK research, you've, you've got Janet as, as a big network organisation. Was any, were they in, included in any of this work and has any work been looked at in terms of the the sort of carbon impact of networking rather than servers? So um, that was outside of the scope. So we did include um, sort of, we, we had to work out where yeah. our demarcation point was. So that the, it tended to be, I guess, up to about routers or maybe one router and you, when you route out to the, the larger part network, that was our sort of demarcation point. And that kit was considered inside. Um, we had, maybe through ignorance, but we had less, um, uh, so we were able to query out energy usage from servers very easily yeah. with the IPMI. We didn't find the, the relevant things from switches and routers. Maybe it exists, um, it probably does in, in, for certain devices. Pro pro probably more does. dependent on the PDUs than you are on the, the right. kit itself. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, I don't know what Janet are doing. I'm sure they have something. Yeah. Um, we probably have someone in the room who could answer some of that or point you towards the right answers, uh, but I, I'm not going to uh, say the wrong thing there. Yeah. One, one, one last quick question then. Um, how, how much do you think the, the uh, impact of fixing net zero is on the users of the equipment rather than the manufacturers of the equipment, and should, should the, the government and things be pushing more on, on manufacturers to, to make green stuff rather than sort of pushing on us to say, make sure you're green and, and you, you're the ones that have got to persuade the manufacturers? So I, I, I'm not going to answer that directly, but the, so the, the, the scoping project, if the strict scope was just the active carbon, but yeah. everyone involved realised that the embedded carbon needs to be addressed, because when we do have wind power, nuclear power, all the renewables in our, is the only energy mix we have in the UK yeah. on the grid, then it's the embedded carbon is the only thing that's important. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we, th that sort of answers that obliquely, I'm afraid. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>